Our world is intriguing and challenging. It arouses a burning desire to understand its laws. Study complex processes. Discover and develop new worlds. Research is the key to understanding the world around us, to finding new solutions in wide-ranging fields. Our researchers lead some of the most important studies in Israel and around the world, in science, medicine, humanities and energy. Learning is how we understand things in depth, discovering new worlds, revealing the secrets of the past and the present for the sake of the future. We unravel the secrets of the human brain, of human behavior, the wisdom of Judaism and heritage, creating exciting new worlds in our laboratories and clinics, impact centers and research institutes. And when we do all this with genuine passion, we earn recognition, respect and international success. We are world leaders in cyber in information science and artificial intelligence. Over the years, we've won awards for research and important discoveries. We're among the academic elite in psychology, engineering, education, and the social sciences. With a spacious, award-winning green campus and 17,000 students from all over Israel and every segment of society, bar -Ilan University, grooming future generations of academia, leading excellence and trailblazing innovations. We invite you to, to explore, discover and to lead. Wow, what a great opening for this evening. I'm feeling proud, proud to be part of an institution that discovers and leads, proud to be a bar -Ilaner. <laughs> Members of bar -Ilan University, Board of Trustees, President of the University, Professor Arya Saban, the University Senior Administration, Dr. David and Dr. Judy Dangur, the, the Right Honorable, Mr. Tony Blair, friends, Good evening and welcome to the gala opening of the 2019 Board of Trustees. My name is Dr. Daniela Gurevich. I'm the director of the Sainaim Dangu Center for Universal Monotheism at bar -Ilan University. First of all, allow me to say thank you. Thank you to all of our university friends and trustees who have joined us here from near and far and honoring us in your presence tonight. We are actually celebrating two events this week, the opening of the Board of Trustees and a national historic occasion, Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day, a day to celebrate, to remember as we commemorate the reunification of our internal capital in 1967. A lot has happened here in Israel in the 52 years since the reunification. Israel today is at the forefront of technology and science, but still under continuous threats by extremist states that suppose terrorism and are a real threat to peace. In light of the past week's events in the southern border and earlier this year, and the uncovering of the Hezbollah tunnels on the northern border, your presence here in Israel is strongly felt as a true vote of confidence, unity, and love. It strengthens our spirit and inspires us to grow, to create, to research, and innovate. And things are changing right here at bar -Ilan as well. The Senaim Dagu program for universal monotheism at bar -Ilan University was promoted earlier this year to become a center. Over the past 10 years, the Dangu program created an intellectual discourse in a variety of fields of knowledge and interest shared by all peoples and all cultures, including health, sports, literature, music, interfaith, and cultural ties between East and West. Our extensive activity bore fruit, 
And now, as a center, we are committed to national and international activity that brings people together and makes the world a better place. Tonight's event is just an example of a work being done in the newly established center. Through the efforts and devotion of the doctors David and Judy Dangor, the center, and in fact, the university, is able to influence society and serve as a bridge between worlds and to act as an intercultural mediator. We are most grateful to the Dangu family for giving us the privilege of hosting our most distinguished guest speaker. To begin this evening's program, I call to the stage the president of Bar Ilan University, Professor Arya Saban. You should see it from here, it looks amazing. The Right Honorable Tony Blair, Dr. David and Judy Dangur, Chairmen of our board, Michael Jesserson and Shlomo Zohar, the Rector, Professor Faust and the General Manager, Zohar Inon, members of the board and their families, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Shalom. We welcome you, Mr. Blair, to bar -Ilan University. We are excited to have you here as a friend of the State of Israel and the Jewish people. I want to take you back to a speech in 2016 in the Jewish Congress in Brussels, where you said that you are about to fly to Israel and this, that this is going to be your 153rd trip to this country. And then you added, I assume with a smile, that you are being kind of teased that you are actually making Aliyah to this country. <laughs> Sir, we are academics. We take words seriously. Hence this evening, I would like to invite you to take the extra mile Join us and become an ambassador of Bar Ilan University. <laughs> I can tell you very objectively, of course, that this is a very, very good deal. I admit that first and foremost, it's a good deal for us. After all, uh, you know this country, you know this place, you know how we live, you know what unites us, you know our dreams, the difficulties, you know our temper. You know Israeli, basic. You may not speak Hebrew, but you know Israeli. And just as important is the fact that uh, you are a loyal ambassador to science and the academic world. And again, I want to quote something that you said back in 2002. You said that the scientific advance with scientific advance, we need better uh, moral fiber. Actually, better judgments and way to analyze our life and our science through morality. I think that your words are becoming more and more important today with the development of life science, computer science, and especially artificial intelligence. Indeed, science must come with great responsibility. And I think that this is why Bar Ilan, our university, is so suitable for this type of relation. Bar Ilan is strongly connected to our Jewish heritage. Our heritage that tells us that if we want to do good science, we need to do it through moral values. It's critical. Our heritage tells us that we must participate in the creation of the world. The world that God finished creating after six days and in the seventh day, he told us that we must participate in this creation. That we must really make a difference in this world. We call it impact. Impact centers were trying to influence thousands and millions of people and make a better world. 
Instead of telling long stories, I want to share with you all an article that was broadcast on Channel 12 just last week, give you the feeling of what it means to make a better world. Please. אחד הקשיים הגדולים ביותר שאיתם יכול אדם להתמודד זה עיוורון. לא מעט פיתוחים טכנולוגיים מרתקים מנסים להחזיר את הראייה לעיוורים. באוניברסיטת בר אילן פגשנו את עידו אפרתי, מוזיקאי וסטודנט עיוור, ואת פרופסור יוסי מנדל, שהפיתוח שלו נותן תקווה ללא מעט אנשים. עידו, ממתי אתה עיוור? אני עיוור מאז גיל שנתיים. יש לך איזה זיכרון של ראייה? לא, אין שום זיכרון. מבחינתי זה כאילו להיות עיוור מלידה. אתה לומד לחיות עם זה כי אין לך ברירה. אתה פשוט מבין ש... שאלה החיים, ובוא בוא נשתמש במה שיש לנו. בשאר החושים למדתי באוניברסיטה, חינוך ומוזיקה. היום אני עובד כמורה. במעבדה שלו באוניברסיטת בר אילן מנסה דוקטור מנדל להחזיר לעיוורים כמו עידו את החוש כנראה החשוב מכולם, הראייה. מה שאתה רואה פה זה שתל שיושב כבר בתוך רשתית כחלק מניסוי. אנחנו חושבים שנוכל להגיע לחדות ראייה כמעט מושלמת בבן אדם כזה, שיושתל עם הרשתית הזאת, חדות ראייה שהיא כמעט מלאה, אתם רואים, ככה רואה בן אדם רגיל, ככה אנחנו חושבים שנוכל להגיע יום אחד, זה עדיין יהיה שחור לבן, אבל אולי בכל זאת בצבע, וזה בעצם מה שנותנת רשתית מלאכותית היום. והשתל הזה הוא כבר עובד, או שזה עוד... דבר שייקח הרבה זמן. זה עוד ייקח קצת זמן, זה תהליך של כמה שנים, אבל אנחנו מתקדמים מאוד, ואנחנו בעצם בשלב הזה, אנחנו כבר מכניסים אותו במסגרת ניסוי. כשתצליח לעשות את זה, בעצם תחזור לייעוד המקורי שלך במה שלמדת, שזה רופא עיניים. נכון, אני מנסה לקחת את הדברים שלמדתי, ולהכניס את הכל למחקר כאן, וגם ללמד את הסטודנטים דברים חדשים, שהם גם, הם יום אחד יוכלו להיות מדענים ולעזור לאנשים. יכול להיות שלשוב ולראות זה חלום. כל כך גדול שאתה עוד לא מעז לחלום אותו? זה חלום גדול. Uh, אני חושב הרבה פעמים על האופציה שהייתי חוזר לראות, ומעבר לזה, אני לא עסוק בלחלום על זה, אני פשוט חי את החיים. ו- 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 וכן, החלומות הקטנים הם דברים רגילים, זה, זה, זה זוגיות, זה עבודה מסודרת, זה כל הדברים הרגילים ש- שאנשים אחרים רוצים בתוך החיים האלה עם המגבלה. כרגע פשוט לחיות את החיים כמו שהם, ולנצל ו- את מה שיש, ולהיות מאושר במה שיש. I saw this movie quite a few times, as you can imagine, and each time that I see it, I feel really proud to be part of this amazing university. <laughs> Esteemed uh, friends, all of you, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you for the board members that are here, some of you that have made a long distance to come here, some that shortest distance. I want to thank the staff and uh, uh, our faculty that are also being present here in this evening, and I'm sure that you will all join me in thanking our mutual friend, Dr. David Dangur, and Judy, his wife, that have made and made this evening possible. Dr. Dangur is a noble man that uh, dedicates his life and energy to advancing education, culture, and art in the United Kingdom and here in Israel. Uh, David's contribution to Bar Ilan goes through the Center for, Advanced, uh, for uh, Personalized Medicine and the help to our Faculty of Medicine, the Israeli Faculty of Medicine in the Galil, and also to the Center for Universal Monotheism that is promoting interfaith harmony. And we believe very much in these connections. Thank you very much, David. We believe that our long-standing partnership will lead us to higher and higher heights. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Blair. I believe that I've convinced you to become an ambassador and a member of Bar Ilan University. In the slight case that I haven't, I would like to finish with a final story. 
A story that comes from the Department of Archaeology at Bar Ilan University, where our researchers are searching for the wine of King David. They want to make the same wine that King David drank and see what happens. <laughs> well, we are not quite there. We still have some time. But meanwhile, they've succeeded to find two types of grapes that were used to make wine in the second temple. That's a few hundred years later. This is a very special wine. And I would like to give you and the Dango family each a bottle of this wine. It is made in very small quantities here in Israel. <laughs> this is wine that dates back to the second temple. Experts say that when you drink it, you feel history in its flavor. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Lechaim, toda raba. In 2017, two years ago, Dr. David Nangur was awarded an honorary doctorate from Bar Ilan University in recognition for his life mission to promote interfaith harmony, for being a tireless activist for ensuring greater relations between Jews and Arabs for his commitment to support health research and science in Israel and in the United Kingdom alike, and for his efforts on straightening the UK-Israel ties. Through the Axel Rach Foundation in London, Dr. David Dangour carries on the mission and the legacy of his late father, Sir Naim Dangour. Together with his wife, Judy, David is establishing a solid foundation for people-to-people -people dialogue, as well as a firm basis to promote the most advanced research possible in medicine. The vision and support enable us new discoveries of improving the world we live in, or by rephrasing Isaac Newton's famous idiom, permitting us to say further by standing on the shoulders of giants. It is with great respect and appreciation I call to this stage Dr. David Dango. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure to be here with you, celebrating the achievements of this wonderful university. And it's a pleasure to see how Barilan is developing under the leadership of Professor Ari Zavan, whose inauguration as president I was honored to attend. I left Iraq with my family when I was 10. We had to leave everything behind. It was our education that helped us to rebuild our lives. That is why, in line with long-standing Jewish tradition, we are passionate about education. And why, when the time came when we could give something back, it was on education that we focused, both in the UK and here in Israel. Barilan has provided a great opportunity for my family to contribute in meaningful ways. It synthesizes the best of Israel, the fusion of our heritage and tradition, together with the future of scientific progress and innovation. Our first contribution was with scholarships. We have supported the studies of thousands of students at Barilan and in the UK. Providing scholarships to students at Barilan is an amazing investment. The investment is relatively minimal, and the return on this investment is a changed life with greater potential for a good career and for a meaningful contribution to Israeli society. More recently, as you've heard, we established the Dangor Center for Personalized Medicine. The center uses advanced technology, big data analysis, and transitional research protocols to promote breakthrough collaborative medical research between researchers and physicians. But the project which brings us together this evening is the Sir Naim Dengur program for universal monotheism. A decade ago, my late father of blessed memory, Sir Naim Dengur, proposed 
that the university take a universal message far beyond the borders of Israel, a message about the ultimate unity of humankind. In particular, he focused his gaze on the Far East and China. Today, there can be little doubt how important it is that we build bridges to that great ancient people. His vision was realized in the Sir Naim Dangor program for universal monotheism. Over 10 years, Dr. Daniel Gurevich, director of the program, built partnerships between Bar Ilan University and numerous universities throughout the Far East and with scholars throughout the world from all three Abrahamic faiths as well as scholars of the Eastern wisdom traditions. That program proved so efficacious that we expanded it. It is now the Sir Naim Dengur Center for Universal Monotheism with a wider remit. Its work has been recognized and praised by the government of China. The center has a mission of great contemporary relevance, bridge building between different peoples, different traditions, different worldviews, and in a sense, different worlds. For all these reasons and more, I am very happy to be here with our dear friend, the former Prime Minister of Britain and Northern Ireland, Mr. Tony Blair. As Prime Minister, he led Britain to record economic growth and dedicated 10 years of sustained and intensive effort to completing the Northern Ireland peace process. He developed Britain's first plan to engage with the challenge of climate change, and he propelled huge innovations in the world of education. Since leaving office, he has been, and is still today, consulted by heads of state around the world. And he has founded the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. As a world leader whose respect crosses international boundaries, he aims to seek for the benefits of globalization to reach the largest possible extent of the human family. The center has worked with institutions around the world to achieve good governance, to grow towards coexistence, to plant the seeds of peace in various parts of the Middle East, and to strengthen centrist political leaders. Our friend and guest tonight is a thoughtful man of faith who has shown much wisdom, and so he is a perfect guest for the Dangor Center for Universal Monotheism. Thank you. I would like to ask Mrs. Vera Murevich, the chairperson of the International Friends of Bailan University, the person who was very instrumental of connecting between the Dango and the Bailan families, to present a token of appreciation to Mr. Dango. antique map of the world as it was then, consisting of three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Three continents coming together to a centerpiece. The centerpiece was the first place dedicated to universal monotheism. That place was the land of Israel and Jerusalem, I'll say it in English, the Torah came forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. The, the Jewish people gave the world a very special, unique gift, a gift that is truly the birthright of all of humanity, and that is the knowledge of one God and his law which is a tree of life and a path of life for all who follow it. May you and your families always be blessed and thank you.
I just have to say that um, I'm very pleased to see Vera here on stage. It was she and Professor Moshe Kave who introduced us, the family, to Barilan University nearly 20 years ago. And uh, tonight, Vera confided in me so that she is now twice over a great grandmother. I, I still don't believe it, but. Uh, well, I started young in Africa, 14. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our special guest of honor, it is a privilege to have with us Mr. Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the Special Envoy of the Quartet in the Middle East. Mr. Blair has openly been proponent of, the, of peace, has clearly suggested that the security of Israel is a global concern, has publicly denounced anti-Semitism and promoted Holocaust education. Former Prime Minister Blair is intimately familiar with the major challenges affecting our region and is an active advancing peace between Israel and its neighbors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tony Blair. <laughs> Mr. Blair will be interviewed by Yonit Levy, a leading journalist and television presenter, the chief news anchor of the Israel leading primetime news program, Kesha Channel 12 News. Please welcome them to the stage. Pleasure and honor to speak with you tonight, uh, and thank you for being here, escaping the madness of British politics straight into the arms of the irrationality of Israeli politics. Uh, I wonder which you would rather talk about. Um, and we have so much to talk about, obviously, Brexit and the Middle East and anti-Semitism and the Labour Party and Corbyn and Trump and Netanyahu and the Blair Institute for Global Change. But before we jump into all that, if I could open with a general question. Um, when you left office, 2007, a mere 12 years ago, but it looks like a universe away when you think about it. The worldwide economic crisis then had not even happened. Immigration was not the problem that it is today. People didn't tweet. Um, populism was, for lack of a better word, not popular. When the President of the United States back then said enemy of the people, he meant uh, Osama bin Laden and not the American press. So it was a different time and a different set of problems. And I wonder when you look out into the world today, what is the one thing that you worry about? What is the one thing that keeps you awake at night? Okay, you know, first of all, can I say it's an enormous pleasure and privilege to be here. I'd like to thank Barilan University and thank you, Professor Zavan and all your staff for um, helping with this event, for giving me this very lovely bottle of wine, which uh, I hope I inherit Actually, I hope my son inherits some of the, um, the, the, the wisdom of King David's son. Um, and it's a tremendous pleasure also, of course, to be with David and Judy, who've done so much to promote not just relations between the UK and, and the state of Israel, but for education here and there and worldwide. So thank you very much, all of you, for having me here tonight. It's a great pleasure. Um, and yes, you're right, you need that, that by the way, it's, there's a sort of thing that happens whenever you're a politician now and you go <clears throat> anywhere in the world and talk to other politicians, the conversation immediately becomes, whose politics is crazier? <laughs> uh, and I'm actually pleased to say that I think we're way out ahead. Um, I, I think you know, I agree. Yep, I think you, th th <laughs> so, you know, this is one thing in which we're excelling at the moment, but um, hopefully we will return to calmer times uh, um, in the in the months or years to come. Um, look, I don't think there's one particular thing that keeps me awake and worries me, but I think if I was to pull all the different component elements, which is a huge change in geopolitics, because for the first time in modern history, uh, the East is going to rival the West. Um, we have a technological revolution whose implications I think we're still only just understanding. And by the way, I love that video. All the innovation and technology you do here is absolutely fantastic. Congratulations on it. But it is a revolution. It's going to change everyone's lives. And one of the things also that's happening is the politics, because of the force of globalization changing people's lives, is throwing up cultural and economic challenges that are reinventing the political landscape that are changing political alliances. And so what you've got 
is a world whose chief characteristic is the scope, scale, and speed of change. And in the world of change, those who are comfortable with the change enjoy it, and those who aren't become frightened by it. Mm -hmm. And my biggest worry, therefore, is that we forget in the, the West that in the end we represent not just a set of interests, but a set of values, that these values are important, and these values are universal. They may have started in the West, but they're universal values, and we need to protect them. Mm -hmm. So in a world that's changing very rapidly, something has to anchor you in this process of change, mm -hmm. whether it's technology or new relationships in the world. And the thing that should anchor us is a belief in freedom, equality, tolerance, respect across boundaries of faith and culture, and a desire to live in peace with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. So these are important things for us to remember. It's not just a set of transactions, it's a set of beliefs and values, and they're worth protecting. So let's talk about Brexit. Um, <laughs> we are sitting here. It's June 2019. Three years ago, June of 2016, Britons voted to leave the EU. I'm not sure there's much to celebrate in this three-year anniversary threshold. Yet another British Prime Minister resigned. Both main parties are in a meltdown mode. Um, British m Britain might be leaving the EU with no deal, which many, including yourself, say is a catastrophe. Now, besides building a time machine and returning to 2016 and telling David Cameron, don't go for this referendum, what would be the way out of this, of this mess? Yeah, it's... Uh... A time machine doesn't sound like a very bad idea, does it? <laughs> time machine, look, bar -Elan, you're doing some great stuff, so just We're fix that for us and we'll be happy to jump on it, um, or at least some of us will. You know, it's, it, again, wherever I am in the world today, People ask me general questions and then they say, okay, now what about Brexit? And um, the truth is this is a destiny changing decision for the country. Um, so if we leave the European Union, it's got huge implications for us. Now you can argue whether it's good or bad, but you can't argue about its importance. We've had three years of negotiation and the problem is very, very simple. It is? You, it is you can leave the political structures of Europe easily, but if you leave the economic structures, that is the single market and the customs union which have been created for the members of the European Union and which are a unique set of preferential trading agreements, if you leave those economic structures in which you've been trading for several decades, then it's gonna be painful to do that. So, some people say, well, you should do that because we want complete freedom in Britain, but that's what I call the painful version of Brexit. Mm -hmm. Some other people say, no, leave the political structures, but stay in the economic structures. The trouble with that is, it's what I call the pointless version of Brexit. Mm -hmm. So the dilemma is, you've got a painful version and a pointless version, and really what's happened in the last three years is that Parliament has been unable to decide which it wants, and the government, Theresa May, I think for perfectly well-intentioned reasons, wanted to do a Brexit that was painless and pointful. And that, I'm afraid, we've learned doesn't work. So we're now three years on, frankly, without a, a lot of resolution. And I personally think probably in the end, the only way we will resolve this is to go back to the people. But whatever we do now is going to be difficult because if we leave the European Union without a further vote, then I think a lot of people will be disappointed who are pro-Europe. If we have another referendum, a lot of people who voted to leave Europe will feel it's a betrayal. So this is a very, very difficult task for us. It's a very difficult um, dilemma for us to resolve. What I would say to people is, we will resolve it eventually. Honestly, Britain's not, you know, this is a temporary period for us, which is very difficult. Um, very challenging, but believe me, Britain will be back and we will make whatever future we have work. I hope that future is in Europe, but even if it's not, we will make it work. You, you will uh, resolve it eventually, before or after there's peace in the Middle East. Just give us a time frame. No, I, think, yeah, I, think, I think right now, I think... <laughs> if Brexit, yeah, well, no, that would be a long... I, I think that the upside about Brexit, it makes the Middle East seem so much simpler, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, well, you know, I used to go back to Britain um, after struggling with the Middle East peace process, and now I'm coming to Israel 
after struggling with the Brexit process. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, to, to, to speak about Brexit a little bit more, obviously you, you were against it, you're from the Remain camp, you're now advocating something like a second referendum. And, and I have to ask you about this, isn't it a little undemocratic to have a second referendum? Because it sounds like what you're saying is, listen, we didn't like what the people decided the first time around, let's try and do it a second time around. Sure, so here's the problem, is that you've had three years of frankly a pretty big mess, we have a lot more information than we had back then. And in the end, you've got to decide what form of Brexit you want. And I think the best thing is to force Parliament to take a decision as to what form of Brexit they want. Do they want the hard Brexit, which means getting out of the political and economic structures? Do you want the soft Brexit, which is just getting out of the political structures? Once Parliament's decided that, I think there is a case because there are all these different forms of Brexit for then putting it to the people. Mm -hmm. And I think the democratic case for that is, in a decision of this magnitude and after this mess, shouldn't you be entitled to think again? Now, it may be that the British people say, no, we still want to do it, in which case you're going to have to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a strong democratic case, actually, for saying, no, it's, we've come through so much and we've learned so much and we've got a you know much more information about what the different forms of brexit are the best thing is to push parliament to come to a conclusion because so far after three years it hasn't by the way mm -hmm. and then ask the people for the final say when you look at theresa through the theresa may and obviously there's uh, a lot of difference in opinion between you but going through these years of excruciatingly trying to dis disentangle Britain from the EU. Um, when you look at her having to resign, do you have any sympathy for her? Do you, do you feel for her? You yeah, know no. how hard it is to be a prime minister, Absolutely. At a, at a personal level, I feel for her a lot. And by the way, you know, I also think she is a decent person who's tried to do her best for the country. Mm -hmm. So I don't... You know, one of the things I think is really unfortunate about politics today is people feel that they can't just disagree with someone. You know, if someone disagrees with me, they're a bad person. No, if someone disagrees with me, they disagree with me. This is democracy. And you know, one of the things I really feel very strongly about Western politics at the moment is that we've got to return to the ability to have a civil discourse between people who disagree. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, we live in a democracy. We should be proud of that. We should be happy that in the end we decide our government and if we don't like them, we can remove them. And, you know, for me, although I profoundly disagree with her on Brexit, I don't think she's a bad person. I think she, on the contrary, believed that what she was doing was in the interest of the country. Now, we can disagree about that, and we can disagree about it honestly, and we should disagree about it in a civil way. So at a personal level, yes, I feel great similarly. Look, it's a difficult job. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing, by the way, I've learned since leaving office is a darn sight easier to give the advice than do the job. That's always true. Yeah. <laughs> That's why some people pick journalism. Um, so, <laughs> I'm I just wasn't going to say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you meant to. Uh, I'm just curious if you had any conversations with her before, after her resignation? Did you offer any words of advice? So the conversations like that are best to remain uh, private. But no, of course, I, I have spoken to her, um, you know, during her time as Prime Minister. And by the way, I've always found those perfectly reasonable conversations, but mm -hmm. you know, the content of that is probably best private. Uh, it looks like Boris Johnson, who's a die-hard Brexiteer, might be the next Prime Minister. Um, before the referendum, he was driving around with his Brexit bus, right? We all remember this. Uh, we send the EU 350 million pounds. Let's fund our NHS uh, instead, the health services. Did Boris Johnson lie to the British public? <sighs> Look, I believe that there will be less money for the health service, not more money, because Brexit reduces the growth in the country. But I think, you know, for me, we're best just to take on that as a political claim and defeat it as a political claim. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, one of the things, if we're going to, if we are going to reconsider, mm -hmm. I think, there's going to be a real debate this time with more information around what it really means for things like public services. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm not gonna, I don't like to trade insults with people, but 
the claim was wrong because mm -hmm. obviously we have not had more money for the health service, we've actually had less. And in any event, it's part, look, it's part of the political battle. And mm -hmm. that political battle, if it's joined again, I think there's every chance it's joined on the basis of a more informed conversation because we've now had three years where some of the consequences of Brexit are much more visible. And look, to be fair to the Brexiteer people, they would say, look, the economy, you know, we've still got low unemployment in the UK, economic growth hasn't fallen off a cliff, we've not gone into recession. And people like me would say, yes, but our currency's down, growth is less, and investments dried up mm -hmm. in certain key sectors. So, you know, this is the battle that, that, that we will have. But I don't, you know, I, I long ago um, learned not to kind of conduct politics by trading insults. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about the Conservative Party, the Tories. This is obviously a problem for um, Jerry, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour as well. They've failed to present a clear view uh, on Brexit. It's probably tactic, but I mean, they've been quite um, equivocal on this. Has it hurt them? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem is on Brexit is that the country remains divided really between those people who want what you might call a proper Brexit. In other words, as I say, you get out of the single market and the customs union and not just the political structures and those people who want to stay. And the problem in a sense, both of the Prime Minister and of, and of Jeremy Corbyn has been that they've wanted to appeal to both groups simultaneously. Well, you know, both groups don't agree, <laughs> right? So you're not going to appeal to them by offering them an alternative that actually satisfies neither of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so the difficulty is, I don't think there is a compromise over Brexit that brings the country together. Mm -hmm. What there might be is a compromise over the process, which I think should be a deliberative set of votes in Parliament and then a final say with the people. There might be a compromise on process that gets you to heal the country. But you know, all over the Western world today, politics is divided. Mm -hmm. And the div divisions are, are deep. I mean, they're bitter divisions. Mm -hmm. You know, I see this when I'm in America. Um, we don't have that here, by the way. No, we're very... <laughs> I was, I was going to avoid saying that. Just checking if the audience is with us. Um, <laughs> no, it's the same everywhere. Uh -huh. And the divisions are really deep. And the one thing that intrigues me, because obviously I'm from a more sort of centrist position in politics, is how do you build bridges today? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you understand the other side's point of view? So I, for example, although I'm in favor of changing Brexit, I don't think we can do that unless we deal with the underlying concerns. Worries about immigration, um, communities that are, feel alienated and left behind, um, inequality, particularly amongst certain groups at the bottom end of society, the implications of the policies of austerity in the UK over the past 10 years or so, you've got to deal with the underlying problems. Because my theory about populism is that populists exploit grievances, mm -hmm. but they don't invent them, mm -hmm. right? The grievances are real. So you deal with them or you're going to get them exploited. Mm -hmm. And you know, where you are in Western politics today is that the divisions are really intense and, and they're reflected, I think, in the media. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, not so well informed, believe it or not, about the media here, but certainly in my country, in the US now, the media is fragmented and because of an anxiety over the declining commercial viability of traditional media, the risk is that their route to commercial survival is to take a group of people and keep them permanently angry, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is what you see. And then the division, you end up with people only listening to a version of events, mm -hmm. not events. And it's a problem for journalism, I think. And it's mm -hmm. a problem because democracy depends on a reasonable exchange of information. Mm -hmm. You know, if you end up with, this is my set of facts and those are your set of facts, it's a problem. You know, I, I had a Democrat friend of mine who, when they were coming up to Thanksgiving uh, last year, I said to him, we will be looking forward to Thanksgiving. And he said to me, uh, no, no, I'm not. He said, I'm not. It's, uh, we had a terrible Thanksgiving dinner last year. And I said, well, what was your problem? And he said, well, we, we had a big argument about, about Donald Trump. And you know, I knew the guy was a Democrat. So I said to him, so, so some of your family were Trump supporters. He said, no, 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 everyone was against Trump. So I said, well, what was the row about? And he said, 
Well, the younger ones felt we weren't sufficiently anti-Trump. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this is, you know, when you get politics and it's like that, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's brutal. But it's also, I think, long-term dangerous unless you get people who are prepared to build some bridges mm -hmm. and understand why people are thinking and voting as they are. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, a big challenge. I think we'll talk a little bit more about populism uh, further down the line uh, in our conversation. But I want to talk a little bit about the Labour Party now. Um, and I want to take you back, if I can, 22 years ago, almost to the day, I'm sure you remember this better than I do, May 1st of 1997, the young leader of the Labour Party won a landslide historic victory. And there was optimism in the air and enthusiasm and you stepped out to the crowd and you said, a new dawn has broken, has it not? And you continue to say that the Labour Party represents the whole nation. I think we'd be hard pressed to say that today. And I wonder, what happens to the Labour Party? When you look at it today, do you recognize it? Um, no. It's a, and it's, it's a pity. Um, no, I mean, the leadership is, is obviously from the far left. Uh, tradition which has never before taken the leadership of the Labour Party. I mean, it's always been a tradition of the left in the UK, but never in a position of leadership in the Labour Party. And to be frank, this uh, anti-Semitism row mm -hmm. is its a shameful thing. I mean, I, 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 if you told me not merely back in uh, May 1997, but at any point in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. that the party I led for 13 years would have a problem with anti-Semitism, I would literally not have credited or believed it. Mm -hmm. And yet it is, and it's there today. And one of the things, you know, it's necessary to say, and I say it back in my own country, and I would say it here, is that anti-Semitism is something you must confront immediately you see it. Mm -hmm. You must confront it because it's not just wrong, it is a poison throughout the whole of society if you do not check it. And you must root it out and defeat it. And you must not let up until it is properly eradicated. Mm -hmm. And I feel that very, very strongly today. And for me, for the Labour Party in Britain, this is a huge challenge. It's got to rise to challenge. It's got to defeat this anti-Semitism. And if it doesn't, it will imperil the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And and it should if it's not rooted out and defeated. You know, uh, in, in February, uh, Luciana Berger, who uh, was a Labour MP, a Jewish Labour MP, she quit the party with seven other MPs and she said, that the labor is institutionally anti-Semitic. Is labor institutionally anti-Semitic? Well, I see why she says it. By the way, Luciana is someone I know very well. I mean, she's from the completely reasonable side of the market, if you like, in politics. I mean, she's a very reasonable, decent person. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> we, we, we are, I mean, we're actually being investigated at the moment by the Equalities and mm -hmm. Human Rights Commission, which is one of the things I, bodies I established. Mm -hmm. And when I established it, and I came into being, I think, in 2007, I never dreamt for a moment that it would be investigating the Labour Party on this issue. So... We should explain how big a deal of it is. The only other party that was under their scrutiny was the BNP, yeah. which is an extreme, sidelined, fascist party, extreme right Look, party. Also, by the way, for the Jewish community in the UK, I think they often, many members of the community felt the Labour Party was their home. Mm -hmm. So this is, look, it's, it's a, there's no point in, I mean, as, as you can tell, I both feel very strongly about it, I don't deny it's a huge problem, and the, what happens now will make a huge difference to not just my attitude to the Labour Party, but to many people who are traditional supporters of the Labour Party and to the country. Look, for the country, and here's the good news, by the way. You know, most people in Britain completely recoil from anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So it's important to state that. But when I have members of the Jewish community in the UK say to me, 
if Labour comes to power under Jeremy Corbyn, we are seriously thinking of moving. I mean, it's just, it's an unbelievable thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's got to be dealt with. Um, it won't go away. <laughs> um, it's, it's, if it's not dealt with, it will result, I think, in a huge crisis mm -hmm. for the Labour Party. Uh, according to a poll done by the Jewish Chronicle, 85% um, of British Jews now say that they uh, think that Jeremy Corbyn is anti-Semitic. Do you think that he is anti-Semitic? Some of the remarks are not explicable in any other way, I'm afraid, and that's, again, very sad. Now, does he think he is? No, he doesn't think he is at all, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, I think the question is what we do about it now. And mm -hmm. obviously, there's one very clear thing, which is you root it out and, you know, the Labour Party has got to deal with this. And if it, as I say, if it doesn't deal with it, it's going to have a huge problem. I, ha however, think there's a bigger thing that we have to think about. And I've been discussing with a lot of people, not just in the UK, but in Europe and actually in America too. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism always ends up in the same place, but it doesn't always begin in exactly the same way. And the anti-Semitism that is coming into Western politics is coming in through a door that is on the left and not just on the right. Mm -hmm. And there are links, for example, I think, between elements of Islamism and the left, which are, again, to me, completely contradictory from a progressive political point of view. Um, there is criticism of Israel that is really so lopsided and disproportionate that mm -hmm. the only sensible conclusion is that it derives from anti-Semitism. And I think we are going to have to fight this anti-Semitism with renewed vigor, but dealing with a lot of the misconceptions that some people put about deliberately and other people hear and listen to almost without really understanding what's behind it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an urgent need to go out today and explain to a new generation of younger people, for example, what is Zionism? You know, what, what is it? What's its derivation? What's it about? What does it mean? A lot of, a lot of young people in countries like the UK and I should think in America too, they have no idea what it means, but it's becoming, for them, a word that's, that's used to denote something that is, mm -hmm. you, you would criticize rather than something that you would both accept and understand and even support. So it's important to, to talk about the state of Israel today. And, and I think not simply to have people who are, who are spokesmen and, w and women from the government going out and talking about Israel, but I, I would like to see people from the politics of Israel who are from outside the government, who are therefore perfectly able to say, look, I've got a thousand criticisms of the Israeli government, but here's why it's wrong to criticize the existence of the state of Israel. Here's the other side of the argument. Mm -hmm. You know, I say to people sometimes, okay, I understand the situation in Gaza is terrible and a lot of work that I do with my institute is to try and change it. But if you've got hundreds of thousands of people in Israel taking shelter at night because there are rockets being fired at the civilian population. Tell me what democratic government wouldn't be taking action against the people doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, the other point of view has got to be put. I often say this to people. If, supposing you were a critic of the government and were accused of a crime you did not commit, under what legal system of the Middle East would you like to be tried? <laughs> There's only one answer to that, it's Israel. Not Saudi right. Arabia, spoiler. Uh, right. right, so, you know, if you, if you happen to be gay, where do you want to be? Not Iran. Right. Am, I, am I good on this test yet? Yeah, and <laughs> you know, half a million people have died in Syria, the biggest displacement of people since the Second World War, and you, you can get a protest easier against Israel than you can against that brutality in Syria. So these are the things, these arguments have got to be made and they've got to be made forcefully and not just by people within the Jewish community of countries or from, from Israel. They've got to be made by the rest of us. Because mm -hmm. this is, I'm not, 
you know, despite what people sometimes say, I'm not a friend of Israel simply because I come here and I like the country and I like the people and so on. I'm a friend of Israel because I believe Israel's security is also about our security in the West. Mm -hmm. It actually matters to us. And it's important that we support Israel. It's important because it's a set of, you know, it is a nation, but it is also an idea. It's one thing that I think it's always important for Israel to protect as well. It is an idea. And it was shown by that, that rather lovely um, excerpt from the, the news about the, the, the blind man and the, the possibilities of giving him sight. You know, what Israel, indeed the Jewish community worldwide, stand for at its best is creativity, innovation, and giving back. You look, at the, you look at the Jewish community in the UK, people like David, you know, proportionately, I can't think there's any other part of the community that does more for philanthropy. So we've got to have people going out and saying this and arguing it and standing up. Now, the good news, by the way, it needs to be organized, but there are plenty of people willing to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I still want to pull you back into the Jeremy Corbyn right. quagmire and I'll ask you whether Let's say this way, if general elections were held today in the UK, would you vote Labour? Yeah, so, uh, you need, this is a question when I answer it, uh, I'll answer back home. <laughs> I was trying to use my Israeli chutzpah, yeah, yeah. but that's fine. But is there, I mean, uh, when you look at the fact that The Guardian just reported that anti-Semitic incidents in the UK are in a record high uh, for the third year in a row, is there a connection? The fact that a major British party tolerates anti-Semitism, thus normalizing it in a way. Is there a connection between that and the fact that anti-Semitism is of course. on the rise? Of course, mm -hmm. there is, and that's what's so shameful about it. Yes, mm -hmm. and the fact that it takes so long to deal with it. And some official from the party, I can't remember, this is maybe going back a couple of months, said, look, there's only 600 instances and we've got X hundred thousand members, and I'm thinking, 600? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I'd been leader and they told me there were 600, 600 instances of racism within the Labour Party, I mean, I would have been, you know, not going to sleep that night. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why we've got to deal with it. You know, we went through this, you said you don't think that he thinks uh, he's an anti-Semite. When you, you, you go through all the lists, when you realize the Sunday Times has documents showing that the Labour failed to investigate hundreds of anti-Semitism complaints, you have the, the story of the mural in East London that you'd have to be blind not to figure out that it's an anti-Semitic uh, uh, mural, and, and his friends, he talks about his friends from Hezbollah and from Hamas, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the list is so long. Um, it, when you have... When you speak to Britons who say, you know, he's blind to anti-Semitism, he doesn't care about it, isn't that kind of letting him off the hook easily? Um, mm. Well, yes, in a sense it is, but we've got to win this battle on a number of different levels. Mm -hmm. And we've also, it's important that we win it within the Labour Party. But is now all I this enough to oust him from being the leader uh, of the Labour Party? Yeah, let's, the Labour Party has his own procedures for that. And let's start with what we're doing at the moment, which is insisting that it's dealt with mm -hmm. and we'll have plenty of opportunities to comment on whether the rooting out's actually happening or not. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being hesitant at all about it, it's that Sometimes what people from his part of the Labour Party want to do is to say, look, this is all a great Tony Blair plot to remove the leadership for reasons that are nothing to do with this, and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I'm always cautious of playing into that mm -hmm. narrative. So, so let's take a breather and talk about uh, Middle East peace. Um, <laughs> always a simple... It's not often you want to talk about Middle East peace for a, for a breather. No, but, okay, let's go with that. Um, <laughs> Obviously, you were a special uh, representative, a special envoy of the Quartet, uh, seeking a priest agreement. Today, is the two-state solution dead in the water, or do you still think it's a possibility? No, it's not dead in the water, but it's, it's only going to happen, in my view, if two things happen. First of all, that there is a genuine cultural acceptance mm -hmm. of the state of Israel, um, and 
if Palestinian politics is unified in a way that is consistent with that cultural acceptance and with the two-state solution and with peace to achieve it. And secondly, which is one of the things my institute really works on now because I gave up the quartet role um, a few years back, but I'm still very active on building the relationship between Israel and the region. So I think this is the key to the peace process for the future. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, the Israeli public has been moving to the right in recent years, doesn't that sort of indicate to you that this is becoming less of a possibility? Funnily enough, it doesn't, because I, I think y you can misunderstand what moving to the right means in this context. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think you can underestimate the cumulative impact of the Second Intifada after the breakdown of the, um, of the peace talks, mm -hmm. and then the withdrawal from Gaza and the subsequent problems from Gaza. And I think what that it means is, you know, and I think this is the reality, and I, I say this to everybody, this is what I've learned dealing with this, you know, pretty firsthand and through several administrations now. Um, the state of Israel needs to know that any independent state of Palestine is going to be properly and securely governed by people who genuinely have peaceful intent towards Israel. Right. If that is an open question or an unresolved question, then leave aside whoever is the prime minister in Israel, they're gonna find it hard to make peace. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things I always do when I explain this to people from the outside is I get out a map of the Middle East. And I, whenever you go into the prime minister's um, office here, here in, in, in Jerusalem, and he's got a sort of map of the Middle East up in the wall. And the thing that always strikes you, and I'm sure this is why he, he, I've never actually asked him, but I'm sure it's why he has it there, is you look at this large region of the Middle East and then you go to this small, small, tiny bit of territory, and that's Israel and the Palestinian territories. And you realize in that context, with this degree of proximity, mm -hmm. unless there's a genuine acceptance of the right of Israel to exist mm -hmm. and a general cultural acceptance of the historic connection of the Jewish people to the state of Israel, it's going to be difficult to, in security terms for Israelis to feel confident enough. Now, I think that's one thing that's happened. But the other thing that's happened, frankly, and this is you know, a tragedy, I think, for the Palestinians, is that in the meantime, over this period of, of going through a failed set of peace processes, um, periodic eruptions of violence and terrorism, the tragic conflicts in Gaza, over all of that period, Israel has been building its strength. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know a lot is written today about Israel and technology, but the fact is I've watched over this last 10 or 12 years that the country is now known and respected for more than just about the peace process or, you know, you've created the state of Israel, but today it's an extraordinary and vibrant country and society. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is also, I'm afraid, just true is that the state of Israel is not gonna put that at risk unless it's sure that it has a genuine partner for peace. So I hope we can get there. I, I mean, and I'm, mm -hmm. I actually believe that Israelis, if they can see a route to peace that's genuine, they'll take it. But they've been through so many different routes to peace that turned out to be cul-de-sacs mm -hmm. and a return back to conflict that they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're pretty, not cynical about it, they're wary. And, you know, you know that better than me and people here know that better than me. So what is important is I think there is a changing region as well, and it may be that the changes in the region, if it also impacts on this issue to do with the Israelis and Palestinians, we might have a better chance of solving it. Because the one thing I do think that Israel does want, and I think the region increasingly wants, mm -hmm. is it wants to be accepted as part of the neighborhood and to work with its neighbors. Mm -hmm. And you know, all over the Middle East, there's this process of reform and change 
you know, trying to happen, if it does happen, in the end, there is that possibility. How hopeful are you from one to 10 that the deal of the century could actually solve this in any way? Well, I'm, I don't know about this particular iteration of the peace process. I am ultimately more optimistic than most people are now. I never know whether this is just my innate nature, <laughs> because, you know, if you're Prime Minister of Britain for 10 years, you've got to be optimistic. Um, so I don't know whether it's just my innate optimism, but actually I am in the end, because I tell you this, in the end, I promise you, the majority of people on both sides would prefer to live in peace if the politics could be sorted out. And the politics can always be sorted out with the right leadership and vision. Um, this is what President Trump said about Israeli politics yesterday. He said, Israel is all messed up with their election. They ought to get their act together. Um, Bibi got elected, now all of a sudden they're going to have to go through this process until September. That's ridiculous, we're not happy about that. Um, what do you think about that? Do you, would, you, would you agree? Well, I, well, I think it's <laughs> President Trump expressing himself in the way that only President Trump does, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, in one sense, sort of admirably frank. Um, yeah, look, you guys are going to go through your process, so let's see what happens. And honestly, I've got enough problem in my own politics, so don't <laughs> ask me who I'm, I'm backing in, the, in Israel. But the one thing that you will, in the end, do is you will sort yourselves out. And this is a democracy, and it's a vibrant democracy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things I always say to people when they say, well, what's, what, what's, what's it like being in Israel all the time, you know, because lots of people obviously have never been, they don't know what it's like. And I say, well, I'll tell you something really weird about the politics. So when you go and see um, prime ministers or presidents of, of other countries and you go for your official meetings, so the two leaders will sit in chairs like that and then there'll be a s chairs going down there, chairs going down there and your, and your associates will sit, your collaborators will sit in these seats here. And in virtually every other country in the world, you know, the two leaders talk, and the job of these guys and these guys is to nod when their guy's speaking mm -hmm. and, you know, to generally be there and supportive and, you know, and very sort of deferential to their leadership. When you're in Israel and you're having these meetings, now these guys are speaking up the whole time. <laughs> no, 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 they're saying, I mean, no, 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 no. You know, I, I love that. It's uh, very... Uh, I wouldn't have loved it so much if Prime Minister that had been happening, but, you know, but that's, that's, that's what it is. And so, you know, in the end, and it's an interesting thing as well, I do find with Israel, I was saying this to someone uh, just the other day, that even though the politics, I think, is sometimes, frankly, a bit unnecessarily brutal, um, at times of uh, crisis and national security, the country does tend to pull together, mm -hmm. which, is, which is great. And I think, you know, the way you're armed forces and the service in, in your armed forces, I think that also gives an enormous spirit of unity in the country, which is important. Uh, we, we spoke about um, populism and, and this is something that you're also uh, dealing with in the uh, Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. You said this, you spoke in the British Academy and you defined populism. You said it's politics pitched as outsiders taking on an elite. It claims to be the only authentic voice of the people. It does not simply cause division, it exalts in it. Opposition to its politics is not seen as democratic, a de democratic disagreement, but treachery. I wonder if when you look at Israel, you see <laughs> seeds of that. I'm, I'm just trying to get you in I trouble, know, that's all. That's I, what I came here to I do. Know. But you know, <laughs> I've now been in politics for several decades. <laughs> so let's not talk about Israel in that context, okay? Because that honestly is your decision, you guys here, who you vote for. And I, by the way, I've had good relationships with this prime minister, with previous prime ministers, and I want to keep it that way, <laughs> to be quite honest about it. <laughs> so, um, Enough said. But, no, what, what I mean is that, that you take the issue of immigration, which is really what I actually was talking about there in the European context. There are real problems on immigration, because immigration changes the way a country looks and feels and, you know, to worry about immigration is not racist, right? So, you know, you've got to, I will say to people, if you don't have controls on immigration, you know, if you don't have order in the system of immigration, and you don't have rules, you can end up with prejudices, right? So put rules in place. 
So that's why when I was Prime Minister, I suggested we had a system of identity. I think today with electronic means, we could have electronic identity, we'd allow you to know exactly who should be here, who shouldn't be here, and so on. So all of these things, are, you can deal with the issue of immigration. What makes me very worried is when people exploit it, mm -hmm. when they turn that worry into anti-immigrant sentiment. Because immigration, by the way, in the end, is good for a country, mm -hmm. right? It's, I mean, when you think of what immigration has done for the UK, I mean, some of our best and smartest people, look, you look around the world, at, at who, who are the people in this cutting edge of technology? Who are the people starting the companies? If you look in the US, you look in the UK, I would say they're disproportionately um, from Im the immigrant community. So immigration is a great thing, but you do need to put controls around it. And what I was meaning with the populism mm -hmm. is that when it spills over, say, into anti-Muslim sentiment, or you know, you you end up targeting people because they're different. I mean, I, I hate that politics. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's very hard to break the thrall of populism, isn't it? Because I mean, you you wrote in to politics in 1997. You were selling hope. Bill Clinton was selling hope in '92. Barack Obama was definitely selling hope in 2008. It doesn't seem like such a great commodity these days. Yeah, well, it's a really good point. But here's what I think. I think a lot of it will come back to this technological revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing I think that's odd about politics today, maybe less so here in Israel, actually, than elsewhere, because you do talk about this technology, because it's become such a big feature of the country. But what I find amazing about Western politics is this technological revolution is the 21st century equivalent of the 19th century industrial revolution. Right. It's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. When I first became prime minister in and even when I finished being prime minister, you had healthcare, education, transport policy, law and order policy, defense policy, and then you had technology. Today, technology goes through all of those areas. It's going to transform everything. So I think the question really is, how do you take this technological revolution and prepare countries for it, allow it to access its opportunities, mitigate its, its problems or its displacement effects, and how do you weave it into a narrative of optimism about the future? How do you take the things that you're kind of inventing here at bar Elan and elsewhere, how do you take that and show people, we can make the future work for you. It can work better. You're gonna do better with this. Because populism ultimately thrives in an era of pessimism. Mm -hmm. If you're fearful about the future, change is a bad thing. If you're optimistic about the future, you're looking at the world in a different way. So this is what I think is the, is the biggest challenge. One of the things my institute is devoted to at the moment is trying to educate today's generation of politicians about the technological revolution and make, it, make a, the right bridge and dialogue between the change makers and the policy makers. And you know, this is important because many politicians, well, look, my kids, by the way, always say to me, Dad, you should never talk about technology in public because <laughs> We have vast accumulated evidence that you don't understand it. Um, but actually, this is today's policymakers need to be in dialogue with the change makers. Because as the president said the, of the university said, he's absolutely right that when this revolution's happening through science and technology, if it's not rooted in some clear values, then there's going to be a huge reaction against it, and it'll become the next target of populism, not the answer to populism. Tony Blair, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the university for the hospitality. Thank you. I would like to call the president of Barilan University, Professor Arya Saban, Dr. David and Judy Dango to the stage. Blair, I've been given the honor of giving you a presentation as a token. I have to admit, I don't know what it is, so please accept. Thank you so much, Mr. Tony Blair. Tonight's event 
connects Israel and the UK, and what a fitting tribute it is to have an artistic event that almost literally screams Britain. Although we did try to bring Paul McCartney and say Ringo Starr, but we settled for the next best option, an Israeli group that reforms the music of the British invasion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Magical Mystery Tour. When I find myself in times of trouble Mother Mary comes to me Speaking words of wisdom Let it be And in my hours of darkness She is standing right in front of me Speaking words of wisdom Let it be Let it be When a broken hearted people living in the world that we there will be an answer, let it be. For though they may be pardoned, there is still a chance that they will see. There will be an answer, let it be. Let it But when the night is cloudy, there is still a line that shines on me. Shine until tomorrow, let it be. Oh, the miracle music, Mother Mary comes to me. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. She loves you 
And you know you should be glad She said you heard the song She almost lost her mind And now she says she knows You're not the hurting kind Because she loves you And you know that can be bad Yes, she loves you And you know you should be glad Woo! She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah With a love like that You, you know, know you should be glad You know it's up to you I think it's only fair Pride can hurt the two Apologize to her Because she loved you And you know that can't be bad Yes, she loved you And you know you should be glad You know you should be glad With a love like that You know you should be glad With a love like that You know you should Something to say. I got no car, and it's breaking my heart. But I found a 